And now I will introduce our second speaker, who is Michał Bartkowiak. And Michał has been a professional progr C++ programmer since 2007. Since 2014, over five years now, also a TTCM3 compiler and a runtime developer at Nokia. From that moment, Michał has been exploring how to make the toolchain faster, reliable, and useful for its users. In his free time, Michał is broadening his, um, broadens his knowledge in modernistic architecture. And this style of architecture is about maximizing functionality, functionality of the building with the help of innovative technologies. And this style often puts function uh, over decoration. And why I'm mentioning that? Because Michał has a similar approach in his work. He's this He's a pragmatist, so in a software development process, he's focusing on that the changes uh, bring maximum value than the rather pure aesthetic improvements. And Michal works on a huge code base, probably some of you too. He also works on the TTC and free compiler, which is used to compile huge code base. Because nowadays, Instant feedback is crucial. This instant feedback from the compilers is crucial. Michal, alongside with his team, and I see those guys here as well, good. They decided to write a new incremental compiler from the scratch to solve the issue of increasing feedback time. And in a moment, in his presentation, making fast incremental compiler for a huge code base, Michal Bartkowiak will tell us more about how he solved the problem of long compiled times. Ladies and gentlemen, this is on. Please, big applause for Michał Bartkowiak. Gata for your kind introduction, and let me thank you all for coming here today. So I'm Michał Bartkowiak from Nokia Wrocław, once again. And I've, been, I've spent the last five years working on this TTCN3 compiler and runtime development. So in the beginning, I have a question to you. Who is irritated with long compile times? Please raise your hands. OK, I can see many hands raised. That's good, because today I want to tell you about making fast incremental compiler for the huge code base. So I believe that this lecture will allow every one of you to become more familiar with the internals of compiler. But more importantly, I want to show you our approach to a challenging problem and maybe inspire you to solve such problems by yourself. So firstly, we'll talk about the business need. Then we'll talk about the data structure, structures that our compiler uses internally. So we talk a lot about the intermediate representation. And finally, I will describe incremental compilation algorithm itself. So shall we get started? So firstly, the business needs. So the TTCN3 language is a domain-specific language used for tests. It's a standardized language. It's used mainly in telecommunication and automotive industry. And it's dedicated for message-based environments. But for this presentation, the details about the TTCN3 syntax or semantics are not crucial. We want to talk about the general concepts, the abstractions, and only a couple of minimal of code examples will be presented. Since it is very domain-specific language, many of the TTCN3 solutions are proprietary ones. And also, this is a case for Nokia. So Nokia has tens of thousands of test cases written in the TTCN3. And consequently, going, growing code base made that the compiler feedback time got longer and became a pressing problem during daily work of many people. So have you ever wondered how many lines of code can tests of single software component have and how fast this number can grow? It occurs that we, when we started thinking about writing new compiler in year 2016, this number was around 1 million lines of code. And today, this number just went over 2 millions. So the growth of the code base is very fast, and we also expect that this trend will continue. And Consequently, the compilation time of the code base grew five times to well over two minutes and became a bottleneck in a daily work 
during development of tests, dur during daily work of many people. So, some of you for sure have seen this cartoon. It's funny, but only at first glance. Because in reality, we as programmers, we are frustrated with long compile times. Because it's hard to do other work or multitask for, for one, two or three minutes or five minutes. This destroys our focus and attention. And usually we want to have our work, work done and move to the next interesting tasks. Let's stay with this cartoon and you can think, then how much can we save? With a daily work of TTC and Free Developer, we are in this area, so around several compilations during a day, and we can save, for example, two minutes. But of course, this picture is also not complete because it does not show, it does not take into account the distractions, which prevents us from streamlining our work. And also, we at Nokia are aiming for the savings of not one single person, but the hundreds of TTC and Free developers. So the potential savings are really huge. So what are our results before I dive into the technical details? So the old compiler was able to compile the whole code base in over two minutes, and our new incremental compiler is able to do this in around 20 seconds. And in case there is an error in the code, so it is a very typical case in daily work of a programmer, old compiler usually took us one minute from our development time to tell us that, okay, there is, a, there is an error in the TTC and free code. And in case of our new incremental compiler, this feedback is instant. It's only a couple of seconds. So what is the consequence here? We made the, the full compilation almost seven times faster and the incremental compilation in case of compiling the code with error, it is almost 23 times faster. And the consequence is that features can be developed in shorter time, bugs are easier to correct, and Nokia spends less on R&D costs. And before we move on to the incremental compilation algorithm, we have to talk about the intermediate representation. So the intermediate representation is a representation used inside a compiler, and it's how the compiler models the input program. So the source code of a program is naturally the input to the compiler, the input data to the compiler. But compiler is usually choosing how to represent such program. So it models the input program to fulfill specific needs. And it's very important because depending on how we design the intermediate representation, it will determine how easily or hard we are able to process it, or even whether we will be able to do certain things. So usually compilers have some high-level inter intermediate representation, which to some extent resembles the abstract syntax tree and models this input program. And to become more familiar with this, let's look at the example from the Clang. So IS IST from the Clang is not a is not taken directly from parser, but it is also a kind of intermediate representation. So many things here are added or calculated. For example, there is many inf much information added about the constructors, destructors, assignment operators. Even one of the assignment operators is generated fully, so the code is generated because it is used here in the code. And this assignment from the code is not modeled Sorry, it's not modeled directly, but instead it is exchanged into the operator call expression and it calls operator up assignment operator, which is generated above. So it's not simple representation of program text, but instead it is how compiler understands the program on a given stage of com compilation. And as you may know, also, this representation is then further translated into the SSA intermediate representation as an input to LLVM to allow efficient optimization and further transformations. Okay, so before we move further into the discussion about the intermediate representation, let's say a couple of words about the TTCN. So, TTCN3 is different from C or C++ language in this sense that it is a module-based language. And the cycles are allowed not only between modules, but also between module items, module definitions, including types, 
and even across modules. This is important because it makes compilation a bit harder. And also the order of, def of definitions in a module do does not matter, although we do not have any kind of uh, forward declarations. And there are also some specific features of the TTCN3, which also makes the compilation a bit harder. And one of them is this deconstructing type expressions, which means that, as in this example, we can define type of some field, for example, in a structure, in the terms of the type of field in other record, in other structure. And you can notice that in this example, if you think where to start processing of these structures, of these modules, it's not even clear because these modules are importing each other and also the types are used between these two structures to define its fields. And also we have implicit importing of types. Again, I will fall back to C or C++, where all dependencies are inlined by the preprocessor and the compiler only has to compile the input code. But here we, for example, in module A, some, we have some type defined. It is used in module B. And in module C, we are using this type def definition. But we are not importing module A into the module C. Oh, I see that this is uh, an error. This here should be B, of course. So here, we are not importing module A, but we still are able to use the definition of this type E, which is, let's say, implicitly imported. And what is more important is that this definition of type E can be only used in certain contexts, so in the context of type E. So it also makes the compilation a bit harder. And also, this TTCN3 language is typing in a hybrid way, so it has both elements of nominal and structural typing. And this is a bit different than system used in many of the industrial programming languages. But for example, on previous presentation, Viktor Kirillov has been talking about the NIM, and NIM language also has elements of structural programming. So let's firstly cope with the cyclic module dependencies. Let's say we have some structure of modules, and we certainly can see the cycles in the structure. And we can try to deal with that by calculating of strongly connected components. Then we have nodes in a new graph where there are no cycles. And we can try to process this graph, try to deal with this problem by compiling of these units of code. But in our case, we discovered that large part of the modules in our code base, well over 500 modules, create one single cycle in the dependence graph. And it would prevent us from having good results from incremental compilation based on such grouping of modules, because it turns out that usually developers change modules from this big interdependent part of the code. And it would, as a consequence, we would have to recompile almost whole code base every time, and therefore the benefit would be minimal. So instead, we had to go deeper. We had to think about the dependencies between module items, and therefore we imposed some requirements on our intermediate representation. And what are these requirements? So firstly, we want to have this module item level granulation. We want to track dependencies between module items, and we want to know whether particular definition has changed. Because if module has a couple of definitions, and then we only change one of them, we want to determine users of this changed definition, and we want to only recompile or recheck the users of this definition, and we do not want to touch the users of other definitions. And this tracking has to be very verbose. We want to have these dependencies given explicitly, without the need to process user code. So we want to calculate some summaries of the modules and then operate only on them. And we also want to process these summaries, these interfaces very fast. So we need tabularized data structures. We do not want to have uh, tree-like structures in the interfaces. 
So now let's talk about the structure of our intermediate representation, basing on ex on very simple example of the code. So we have module A, single function inc, which takes integer, returns an integer, and basically all it does is that it increments its input value by one and returns it. And let's start from analyzing the statement expression. They are of course represented as a part of abstract syntax tree, because this is the most convenient way to do this. But as we go up the data hierarchy, we find this module item, module definition, it's a function, and here we see that it is described as regular structure. It has some fields, like fields which inform us about the name of the function, about the sequence of input parameters, about the return type, possibly about some other TTCN3 specific information which is here omitted for clarity. And the body of the function is represented by this part of AST. And again, let's underline this. This is not a node in, an, in some abstract syntax tree. It's regular structure. And all of the top level module items are represented this way. And they constitute this module code, module definition. And we have to calculate module interface to be able to operate, to detect these interdependencies between module fast. So let's see how it is represented. So it is a short summary of this externally available information from a module or about a module. So it's compact tabularized set of data used both during interactions between the modules and during compilation of the module code. So there are four tables in the interface section. So firstly, the symbol table. It, of course, informs us about the uh, definitions, top level definitions, top level names, which can be found in a module and are exported. We have type table, which tells us all information about the, the types used in a module. We have import table, which tells us which other modules this given module uses. And we have a link table. And link table is a table in which we are tracking the dependencies between modules, not on this module level, as in case of import table, but there we have entries which informs us which particular definitions are used from other modules. And let's see how this interface is filled in case of our very simple model. So firstly, we have an entry in symbol table. It tells us that inc is a function definition simply. And in a type table, we have an entry that somewhere in the module we are using type of function which takes in an integer, returns an integer, and actually the type of this ink function is this particular type. And this is whole information about a module we have. So now our compiler is not invoked on a single file like compilers of also many other languages, but the whole program is compiled at once. Why? Because in order to implement our incremental compilation algorithm, we want to know all the interactions between modules. And this knowledge is crucial for our algorithm, so our intermediate representation is designed to represent all compiled modules at once. And now let's examine the interactions between modules. So let's un introduce another module, which is very similar in the terms that it also has one function, even simpler one, because it does not take any arguments and it does not return any value. And now we, inside this function, want to use this ink function already known. So firstly, we import module A to module B. It is reflected as an entry in import, import table. And then we have an entry in link table, which tells us that, OK, this ink is a symbol, is an absolute reference to a symbol taken from module A, and leads us to the particular entry of symbol table of module A. And finally, we want to have, we want to know the type of this call expression to ink function. But here, we do not want to directly copy the information or copy the integer type because this would lead us, in some cases, to losing these dependencies to module A and to function ink. So instead, we want to have frozen operation here. So we remember not the integer type, but how this type 
was obtained. So we remember that it was the return of ink function, and ink function is described by entry in link table. So we will still be talking about these frozen operations a lot. But what is crucial in here is that all interactions between modules are going to, through module interfaces. There is nothing referred directly from the module code, one module code, to the code of other module. So now that we know a general structure of our intermediate representation, let's talk a bit about the TTCN3 type system. So TTCN3 is a statically typed language. It's mostly structurally typed. And what does it mean? So to know more about the structural typing, to have some intuitions about that, let's contrast it with nominal typing. So nominal typing is checking against the definition of a type. And this is the typing which is present in languages like C, C++, or Java. So if we have two definitions of, of types, even if they have the same structure, they are different types, they have different types. But in structural typing, it's different, because if we have two definitions of types and these structures, for example, are, have the same structure, the same fields, then they are compatible. So checking against the structure is the structural typing. So uh, let's understand the difference on an example. For example, we have two records and they have both fields f of type integer and then they can be interchangeably used in the language. So we can have function which takes a type as an argument, but we can present it with, we can pass argument of type b to this function and it would be okay because those types are compatible. And even this works recursively if we define types a2 and b2 in terms of types a and b, which are compatible as we already know, then still we would be able to use interchangeably a2 and b and b2. So for, to well understand the structural compatibility is to know that, for example, if we have structures with the same fields of the, the same types, they constitute compatible types. And what is very important is that type determines interface of the, uh, the runtime interface of a type. So if two types are structurally compatible, then they also compatible at runtime level, so they are indistinguishable by the runtime. And this is very important because this would be the basis for our incremental compilation algorithm. Okay, so now we know the TTC and T3 type system, so let's talk about the representation of types in our intermediate representation. So we want to have this abstract representation of types. You have already seen it uh, on the example. Why we need this abstract representation? Because we want to have this representation very compact, faster, fast to process, and we want to store this representation in the module interface. So we do not want this AST trees there. And we want to have this representation to support also structural typing, so it also has to be quick for comparisons for the structural compatibility checking. And the other very distinctive feature of this type system in our compiler is that Types can represent selected operations, these frozen operations. So we want to have, for example, such operations like taking the type, the return type of some function or type. We want to have type of nth argument of other type, for example, a function. Or we want to have this type of field named, here goes the name, of some other type. So once again, why do we need that? So for example, we have module A where we define type I, and then module B imports module A and uses I to define type of field F in record R, in structure R. And module C imports module B and uses field F in some operation. And now, again, we do not want to copy the information that this type is integer, because then we would lose the dependency to module B. Instead, we want to here know that this type was obtained by taking field named F 
from the type R. And then we know exactly from where this type came from. Otherwise, if we lose then this dependency, then, for example, we would be checking against this type, this integer type, but in the same time, this module can be changed and we can define type of field F as other type and we would not get this change into our algorithm. So let's summarize this intermediate representation in our compiler. So firstly, we separated module interface and module definition. We have this verbose preservation of dependencies between modules to track them, to utilize them in the algorithm. And that this type system of TTC and three language is a bit more complicated or a bit unusual because it support, supports structural typing and it also has some uh, language intrinsics which forced us to have dedicated representation separated from the syntax definition and also that this, these types can sometimes be represented as those frozen operations in some cases. So now let's move to this incremental compilation algorithm finally, but let's start with the Wikipedia definition of the incremental compilation and let's read it loud. So an incremental compiler is a kind of incremental computation applied to the field of compilation quite naturally, whereas ordinary compilers make so-called clean build, that is rebuild all program modules. Incremental compiler recompiles only those portions of a program that have been modified. But in our case, this definition is not complete because, as we already said, we have these far dependencies and this definition is based on C and C++ based intuitions because C or C++ compiler does not have to track this, these dependencies. Instead, all dependencies are inlined by the preprocessor. So in our case, we are when we, where we have many kinds of dependencies between modules, these far dependencies, and we do not have headers but modules, we think that this definition should be supplemented with the following wording, and it would read that our incremental compiler recompiles only those portions of our program that have been modifi modified or impacted directly or indirectly by the changes in the changed modules. So what is the key idea behind our incremental compilation algorithm? So the key idea is that our intermediate representation in the same time represents two versions of a program. So first, the old correct version of whole program, which is taken from the previous run of a compiler, from previous compilation. And the new hypothetical version of whole program, where the changes introduced by the users are taken into account. And changed modules are modeled as new modules added to the representation of whole program, but they are uh, at the level of this incremental compilation algorithm processed only to the point where interfaces are known. Are known. So we are calculating these short summaries and nothing more. And at this intermediate representation level, all modules are treated in the same way. So all of them are regular modules. But the only information we have is that we have some mapping between the versions of modules. So we know that certain module is a new version of some, mo some other module. And the crucial thing here is that incremental compilation algorithm has to decide what needs to be recompiled, but the recompilation of these detected modules is done in the same way as regular compilation. So now let's take a bird's eye view of the algorithm before we dive into the details. So we have a sum program represented by the uh, set of modules and we have dependencies between the modules. And now let's change two modules. So for example, these modules are changed. So our algorithm will firstly s select the modules which are directly impacted by the changes, so direct users of the changed modules. Then we want to select indirect dependencies, so the modules which are using modules which are impacted directly. We want to catch these far dependencies in this step. And as you may notice, this impact can be far-reaching, we selected quite many modules, and at the core part of our algorithm, we want to check which of these 
selected modules should be recompiled, so which are in fact impacted by the changes introduced by the user. So for example, our algorithm will select these three modules are impacted and we basically forget about the other <laughs> modules. And it's very different from this approach with strongly connected components because, for example, in this structure we have one single strongly connected component here and if we base on this idea, then we would have to recompile all of the modules from this set. So we would recompile much more than our algorithm is able to select, actually. So let's now take this deep dive into the algorithm. So we know how changes are modeled in our ER, intermediate representation, and we want to detect which modules have to be recompiled. So let's say we have a program which consists of nine modules, and we change two of them. And as we already said, we, represent, we have representation of these modules which is the same as other modules, uh, with the only difference that they are shallowed process, so we only calculate interfaces of the changed modules. And in the first step, we want to find all modules which are directly impacted by the changes. So we take this import graph, so we take this import relations between the modules, and then this information, which modules are directly inf influenced by the changes, is given directly. So we see which modules are importing the changed modules, and we simply select them for the next step. And in the next step, we want to run the name resolution process. So we take all of these modules selected in previous step, and we take link tables of these modules, and for the each entry in link table, we run the name resolution process again, and obtain new links to the new versions of changed modules. And one thing is here crucial, if the name resolution fails at this step, then we, for, for some module of course, then we immediately know that some modules have to be recompiled. But this is a trivial case, and we will not be talking about it uh, anymore. But if there is no error, as in the, the example, we know that we are able to successfully rebind all of the links from the old versions of modules into new versions of modules. So as a result, we obtained a mapping for these link tables, which maps all the name resolution into the new one. And we save this map for later. And before we move on to the third step, we have to talk about yet another structure in the compiler, the link graph. So starting from the import graph, link graph can be a bit simpler because some, some uh, imports can be unused, so they are just disappearing uh, from the graph. But the crucial uh, the difference to the import graph is that it connects module not to other module, but to the definition use, definitions used from other modules. So we, we can have many connections between uh, two modules. And it shows us these actual interactions, the links between modules, not the hypothetical interactions introduced by the imports, imports between modules. And it then allows us to iterate over the links and achieve this better granularity, because this structure, this link graph, will be used in next steps to iterate over the links with this desired great precision, better than, than in case of import graph, and examine this type compatibility between types of used definitions between modules. But for the next step, we will visualize only the single connections to have the picture a bit more clear. So in this third step, we want to catch these far dependencies we, we have been talking about much today. So then we want to select all modules which are potentially impacted by type changes. So we select modules which can, which can be reached through the link graph from the changed modules, going backwards through the links as far as possible. So we select quite many modules in this case, because they are all can be impacted by the changes in the change module, by the type changes. And th these modules are selected for the next phase. And in the next phase, we want to clone structure 
of modules potentially impacted by type changes. But this cloning is not full cloning of the modules, but we only do a shallow copy. We clone on only the interfaces. We have to now rebind the links. So if the link from cloned module leads to the un unchanged and uncloned module, then the link is already there. In case of links between cloned modules, we have to just update the module to which the link leads, and also the links are already there. And now, to find the links to the, to the new versions of changed modules, we use the mapping already calculated in previous steps, and we simply use it to bind from cloned modules to the changed modules. And what have we just done? We created a representation of the program, which includes user changes. And this is what we already called the new hypothetical version of the program. And now we can reason about two versions of the program, compare them. So in the core part of our algorithm, we want to calculate this minimal set of modules requiring recompilation. So we start with the modules changed by the user. And then we, we will be iteratively trying to extend the set until we gather all modules that are in fact, in fact impacted by the changes. And we, as we already said, the types constitutes this runtime interface. So we will be using the structural typing to decide, to detect if the interface of given symbol has changed. And now we can also understand why we model two versions of a program. Because, for example, we can have some function f. It is in a module which can be directly influenced by the changes introduced by the users. And, for example, let's say that this function uses some type from changed module as an input, as a type of input parameter. If the changes introduced by the user makes alt type incompatible to the new version, then we would have to recompile not only the directly influenced modules, but for example, we would have to recompile also all of the users of function f, so possibly this module. And these are these far dependencies we have to take into account. So now let's concentrate on a single step of, of our algorithm. So we have to check all users of a given module. Let's start from the changed module. And we know that this link graph gives us all the connections between module and definition used from other module. So for example, let's say that in the old version of program, we used definition A from this module. and this module uses definition B or C and C from the changed module. And we know that we were able to successfully rebind the link, so the name resolution process uh, finished without an error. And now we want to check for every of these symbols whether its interface has changed. So we take these types one by one and compare the types of this symbol structurally. And let's say, for example, that the types of old version of A and new version of A are compatible. In case of B, there is no compatibility. And in case of C, there is a compatibility. What does it mean for our, our, our algorithm? It means that we do not have to recompile the module which uses symbol A because the types are compatible. But we would have to recompile this module which uses symbols C and D because at least one of the symbols in the new version of a program has different type, has incompatible type. And then we are adding this module to the set of modules selected for a compilation. So what would be the result? The result would be the set of modules we have to recompile. Let's say that these are these three modules. They are impacted by the changes introduced by the users. And in the last step, of this incremental compilation algorithm, we forget about this new hypothetical version of program and simply select these three modules for the recompilation and compile the new versions of the changed modules, of course. So you may think, what is the real strength of the algorithm? So the real strength of the algorithm is its ability to differentiate between two cases for the same module. And 
Let me describe this differentiation on an example. And let's take some module S from our code base, and is, it is a module which is used almost everywhere in the code base. And in case when we change some widely used module item from that module, of course, we change one module item, we cloned very many interfaces, so it means that the potential impact of the change is very big, and we selected quite many modules for a compilation. And actually, there is nothing we can do about it, because if something is used everywhere, then of course, if we change it, then we would have to recompile a big part of our program. But it is not a typical case in daily work of developers. So the typical case is that we are changing rarely used module item or rarely used definition, or even we are working inside some function. And then, okay, we change some rarely used module item from this omnipresent module S. We have calculated that the, that the potential impact can be actually very big. We cloned many interfaces, but our algorithm was able to detect that only three mod modules are in fact impacted by the changes, and they are selected for a compilation. And here lies the strength of our algorithm, its ability to detect, to differentiate between these two cases. So let's summarize our approach to incremental compilation. So the main concept was this fine-grained processing and using of structural typing to decide on type compatibility and consequently decide which modules are really have to be recompiled. And implementation of these ideas was possible, was possible to be done efficiently because of those compact tabularized interfaces. And then algorithms built around those interfaces are very fast. And we have this cheap cloning of interfaces, which allowed us to create this new hypothetical version of the program, which we were able to reason about. And once again, let's see the results. So we are able to compile two millions of lines of code in mere seconds, and in case then we have some type errors which have to be recorded, uh, reported to the user, then the uh, reply, the result of compilation can be almost instant. And as a final thought, I would like to share you with two thoughts about making this new compiler. So first one is this technical achievement that we solved from uh, some very big challenging problem. And we designed these structures and ways of processing it to compile this huge code base almost immediately. And this is what this presentation was about. And I hope that you learned a bit about how certain part of parts of a compiler can work. But I think that this most important and most satisfactory one uh, thing th is that we made developers at least a little less frustrated. And in the end, this is where the most of our satisfaction comes from. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michal. And we have 15 minutes for question. The rule remains the same. So all, any one of you who'd like to um, pose a question to Michal about the, what they did as a team, yeah. please come a little bit further here with we, there's a mic waiting for you, and I encourage you to, to come a little bit closer because then your question will be heard, recorded, and everyone could, could use it. Here we have first volunteer. Thanks. Big applause for the first volunteer. Uh, purely out of my curiosity, uh, how big is this in terms of memory? Because you are creating uh, some intermediate files, some uh, trees and tables, and I assume you are using quite a few threads. Mm -hmm. So what yes. are the uh, compilation requirements? So can I run it on my PC that have only eight cores, or I need some big server that have huge amount of RAM and at least 40 threads? OK. so. Uh, the answer is that we use a lot of memory, but currently uh, we mainly compile at server machines, which are which have big amount of memory. But if you have a laptop with, let's say, 16 gigabytes of RAM, it's not a problem to compile this two million uh, line co code base uh, by yourself on your laptop. And actually, some of people are are already doing this, and it occurred that on laptops uh, the times are even better than on servers. But uh, we will be working on uh, constraining these memory requirements be because we want to use all these 
compiler machinery to also build uh, support in an ID for programmers. And in order to do that, of course, we would have to uh, lower this memory requirement. So at, as a first step, the main requirement for us was compile very fast, and the, on, the second step would be to constrain this memory. As far as I remember, it's now under uh, something between 8 and, and 9 gigabytes of RAM needed to compile this uh, full code base from scratch. Thank you. Nice number. OK, thank you. Next question. I want to ask a question about code parsing, because the, the talk was about the compilation mm -hmm. optimization. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering whether you need to parse every single file uh, each compilation. And I was wondering if there's a way to skip the modules that weren't modified mm -hmm. just in line with something like C++, so we don't have to load data to memory for each new, for all of the modules, but only if the, the ones that were modified. Yeah, of course, in this incremental compilation, mm, we are not parsing all of the modules. We only parse changed modules. In fact, because of we are representing whole program and we want to track all of the dependencies, so our compiler also works as a build system for this DDCN3, let's say. So it is invoked on all files or potentially included files, and then we are selecting, basing on the uh, saved information from previous runs, which, have to, which files have to be reparsed, and we are working on only of, on these uh, files, and these files which were reparsed, these are these changed modules, actually. And the information about the other modules is, of course, taken as a result from previous compilation. Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so the way you split modules into units and represent connections between them uh, kind of reminded me of the actor model. So my question would be, uh, is it possible to distribute this compiler on several machines to fasten up the build even more? Do you have any views and processes on that? Yeah, I think there would be no uh, any problem. There would be no problems with distributing that. But I think, in the same time, that our compiler is so fast that uh, this distribution, of, for example, over the network, would introduce some latency. And it would maybe it would be maybe even slower. Maybe in case of this full compilation, but uh, full compilation uh, without this incremental compilation at all, at all also takes about 30, 32 seconds. So it is also quite fast. If we would like to distribute the work, maybe uh, the latency would be a problem. And also this final step, which is not mentioned here, so this let's say code gun uh, of our compiler has to be done uh, as a single step still. So I would expect that uh, the impact of distributing these calculations would not be very big. It would not make the compiler much faster. OK, thank you. Hi. And I have a follow-up question to the very first question that was uh, asked here. And how do this new compiler or the resource usage, uh, I mean RAM and CPU usage uh, during the compilation compared to the old compiler that used a clean build? Mm -hmm. OK, so old compiler for sure uses mm, less memory, but this is something we will be working on still. Uh, and in case of the threads, the old compiler is one threaded compiler, so it uh, makes all the com uh, computations sequentially. And in our case, we have this model of processing that some pipeline steps are actually parallelized. For example, parsing, type checking. But this detection algorithm is actually uh, single-threaded because it's that fast that there would be no big benefits from para para parallelizing it. OK, thank you. And uh, one more thing. Uh, do you plan on open sourcing uh, this solution or mm -hmm. not really, and you tr want to keep it proprietary? OK. so. There are no plans for open sourcing it. Maybe they will be in future, but we are not concentrated uh, on them. But for example, let me make some, some nice statement that, for example, this model of compilation could be easily employed in a NIM compiler, which was mentioned in previous lectures. So this NIM language, Victor was talking that they wanted to have, they want to have this 
incremental compilation. So this model of compilation could be easily adapted there. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, you've mentioned that you are building the whole dependency graph between the mo modules and uh, things inside the modules. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of your examples showed that uh, even if you just uh, modify one file, you can impact a lot of like thousands of, fi uh, mm -hmm. of files. Uh, have you thought of how to use uh, your dependency graph uh, to build uh, something like a modernizer or a refactoring helper tool? for the developers to minimize the dependencies between the files? Well, actually, there is a plan for something like that because uh, if we start the work on this uh, support for integrated development environment, of course, the first steps would be like auto-completion and so on, but in the next steps, we already were thinking about introducing some tools which you mentioned, so, for example, reformatters, uh, renamers, yeah, and for that, of course, we have to track these dependencies very explicitly, and of course we will be using these graphs, or or, uh, or import graph or link graph, depending on the use case. Like, so for sure we will be using these structures. Yeah. Yeah, great, thank mm -hmm. uh, Hi, I wanted to ask: uh, Have you like uh, considered, uh, for instance, using uh, LLVM as a base for uh, for the compiler, or what are your thoughts in this area? Uh, okay. Well, this was, of course, idea which has been evaluated, but uh, our compilers does not generate this machine code, yeah, because it's compiled on a runtime, uh, TTC and free runtime. So, uh, of course, maybe it would be possible, but we think that in case of the TTC and free language, it's better to have this runtime environment uh, due to the fact that it's very high-level language, and uh, using of the LVM would be just another step. So. Even if we would use LLVM, then uh, also this incremental compilation algorithm would be profitable because we would yeah, select definitely. only changed modules for a compilation. Yeah, but but basically, we uh, now we are not thinking about using LLVM, rather about modernizing this runtime environment as well. Uh, so this runtime environment is also some uh, in-house product? Yes. Or? Okay. yes. Whole tool chain is uh, in-house product of Nokia, not only compiler and runtime environment, but also some tools, plugins, uh, well, it's not more maybe very big ecosystem, but it has a couple of parts, <laughs> certainly. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay, so in this case, please, one big round of applause for Michal.